Good morning. Welcome to our worship together. Would you like to take your seats? We gather together at this time and remember that we are thankful for this land on which we gather. And we're thankful for the first peoples who have cared for it, for the Boonwurrung and Boonwurrung people of the Kulin Nation. We pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And we continue to affirm the church's commitment to work with our first peoples to see a better future for them. Just before we begin, thank you so much for your care and uh, messages and concern last week when I was unwell. I do really appreciate it and it was lovely to hear from many of you. As we begin our worship, let's hear some words that are based on Psalm 42, one of the Psalms for this week. As surely as the deer pants for flowing water, so our souls long for you, O God. We thirst for you, O living God. We long to see your face. We bring to you our praise and thanksgiving, prompted by the overflow of the reality of your presence. When we are cast down and troubled, our hope is still in you, O God. Despite our fears, we still praise you. Our help, our rock, our God. This morning I came across some words by Archbishop Temple which just struck me as something that could be good for us to consider. He was talking about the purpose of worship and as we gather, I thought it would be worthwhile hearing. He said, to worship is to quicken the conscience by the holiness of God, to feed the mind with the truth of God, to purge the imagination by the beauty of God, to open the heart to the love of God, and to devote the will to the purposes of God. Let's worship God together as we sing together, God has spoken by his prophets. Let us come before God in prayer. Let us pray. Living God, our comfort and strength on the journey of life, we praise you for your love towards us and towards all creation, for the supreme demonstration of your love in revealing yourself to us in Jesus through his life and teachings 
his death, resurrection and ascension and exaltion. God of all power and truth, we praise you. We praise you for the ways you are at work in our world, for your acts of grace, for your words of life. We thank you, O oh God, that you chose to create us in your image. Thank you for the ways you understand each one of us, for the ways you watch over us, the ways you renew and restore us. We praise you, O oh God, for your limitless grace and your transformative power. Merciful God, we rejoice that our relationship with you is not dependent upon our performance, but your love constantly reaches out to us. Forgive us, O oh God, when we take our eyes off you and become overwhelmed by the circumstances that we face. Loving God, help us to see you in the midst of other things that clamour for our attention. Forgive us, O oh God, for those times when we fail to serve others as you have commanded us to do. Forgive us when we have failed our brothers and sisters who struggle to find a safe home. Help us, O oh God, to recognise how we can stand with and for those who've been alienated from their homes and their homelands through violence and abuses of power. Gracious God, cleanse, renew and transform us by your life-giving spirit through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We hear some words of Paul from 2 Corinthians where he reminds us that in Christ we are reconciled with God and our trespasses are not counted against us. So we are thankful to God for the forgiveness we experience in Jesus Christ. We're going to sing a hymn together, the hymn that's based on Psalm 139, which reminds us of God's intimate care and understanding of each of us. O oh God, you search me and you know me.
We come now to our time of hearing our Bible reading and Maxine's going to bring that to us today. Thank you. Reading from 1 Kings chapter 19 verses 1 to 14. Elijah on Mount Sinai. King Ahab told his wife Jezebel everything that Elijah had done and how he had put all his prophets of Baal to death. She sent a message to Elijah, May the gods strike me dead if by the time tomorrow I don't do the same thing to you that you did to the prophets. Elijah was afraid and fled for his life. He took his servant and went to Bathsheba in Judea. Leaving the servant there, Elijah walked the whole day into the wilderness. He stopped and sat down in the shade of a tree and wished he would die. It's too much, Lord, he prayed. Take away my life, I might as well be dead. He lay down under the tree and fell asleep. Suddenly an angel touched him and said, Wake up and eat. He looked around and saw a loaf of bread and a jar of water near his head. He ate and drank and lay down again. The Lord's angel returned and woke him up a second time saying, Get up and eat or the trip will be too much for you. Elijah got up, ate and drank, and the food gave him enough strength to walk 40 days to Sinai, the holy mountain. There he went into a cave to spend the night. Suddenly the Lord spoke to him. Elijah, what are you doing here? He answered. Lord God Almighty, I have always served you alone, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars, and killed all your prophets. I am the only one left, and they are trying to kill me. Go out and stand before me on top of the mountain, the Lord said to him. Then the Lord passed by and sent a furious wind that split the hills and shattered the rocks. But the Lord was not in the wind. The wind stopped blowing and then there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was a soft whisper of a voice. When Elijah heard it, he covered his face with his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. The voice said to him, Elijah, what are you doing here? He answered, Lord God Almighty, I have always served you alone, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars and killed all your prophets. I am the only one left and they are trying to kill me. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, we give thanks. Mother Teresa and Nelson Mandela and Fred Hollows are names that we immediately associate with certain activities. Their work continues to outlive them. And each of them drew like-minded people around them to share in the work that they were doing. And so the work in their own lifetime expanded. And hence today, that work continues. So we continue to think of them linked to this work that they were involved in. In thinking of that, it becomes quite obvious that they were not indispensable to the work. They'd drawn others around them, and as a community, the work continued. 
They nurtured these communities so that they would be able to continue the work as time wore on. Our story today is about Elijah, one of those most well-known of the prophets in the Old Testament. And he had a reputation for troubling Israel. He was prepared to confront kings and to challenge them about their behaviour. And he was prepared to trust God in incredible ways, trust God to do amazing things to convince the people that God was active. This particular story follows immediately after chapter 18, where we read of Elijah's encounter with the prophets of Baal. These prophets were known in the land as prophet, these gods rather, were known in the land as gods that brought prosperity and that may bring rain at times when it was needed. And at this point in Israel's history, they were in drought and famine. So they needed rain and they needed prosperity. But Elijah, of course, challenged these worshippers of Baal. And he challenged them very effectively. And there was a great demonstration of God's power as the offering he offered to God was consumed by fire. But in the minds of the surrounding community, he was probably seen as a traitor. He was disturbing the tranquility of the community and he was threatening the prosperity of Israel. It's an interesting story and from that story flows on the story that we encounter today. A story that deals with very practical, ordinary realities of life. There's some drama in it, but that's not the focus of the story. The focus of the story is ordinary, everyday things. You see, despite his outstanding faith that he exercised in that situation with the prophets of Baal, Elijah quite quickly became seriously discouraged. When Jezebel threatens to kill him, he fears for his life and he immediately runs away. The fear overtakes him and he wants to save his life. Now, not surprisingly, after an amazing series of events with these prophets, underneath it all, Elijah is exhausted and disappointed. And so he begins, once he flees, to express his frustration to God. He's drained and overwhelmed by the circumstances that he faces. It's a little like the story of Moses in the wilderness who similarly complains about his exhaustion and how he can't continue to lead these followers of God. Like Moses, Elijah gets to a point where he thinks his life's not worth living. He really can't go on. In the midst of that, though, he experiences the presence of God. Now, I'm sure we all understand something of the reality of those times when we feel drained and frustrated. It's an experience we all encounter at different points in our lives. But God's response to Elijah is really encouraging. It's encouraging to us to know how God will be with us in such times. It paints a beautiful picture of a sensitive and loving and caring God that gives to Elijah just what he needs at the time, even though they may be fairly ordinary, basic things. Initially, he just provides him with nourishment and refreshment and rest at the hands of an angel. And he doesn't do that just once, he does it twice to make sure that Elijah is indeed properly refreshed and nourished and renewed. These very practical needs of this prophet were honoured and from that, there was space to air his complaints and to feel that he was truly heard as he aired them. Elijah's complaints do give us some insight in how the power of our emotions can skew our thinking. I'm not sure if you notice there some of the differences in how Elijah perceived his situation and how it really was. In the previous chapter, we read about the prophet Obadiah and how Obadiah had rescued a hundred of Israel's prophets and closeted them away so they were safe in the face of Jezebel and Ahab. So we know there's a hundred prophets tucked away there somewhere. And then after the sacrifice was made, 
and was received by God in the previous chapter, we read, when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, the Lord indeed is God. The Lord indeed is God. So amongst these people of Israel, there were certainly some who were acknowledging God in their midst. And then after God converses with Elijah in this passage, God says to him, I will leave 7,000 in Israel whose knees have not bowed to Baal, whose mouths have not kissed him. So Elijah's repeated complaints that he's the only one left aren't quite accurate. Well, not factually accurate, but they give us an honest insight into how he's feeling and the level of distress that he's experiencing. And the response of God to these complaints is also interesting. There's no rebuttal of what Elijah is saying. There's just a quiet listening and understanding, it seems, and understanding and appreciation of his individuality and his weaknesses and his stress points. Elijah's the recipient of God's patient care as he processes these things in his own mind. The emphasis, though, is on the reality that there are more people there. He isn't really alone. There are others, others that can be there to support him and see him through. And in fact, the challenge that's given to him is to re-engage with this broader community, to commission Elisha to join him in his work and eventually to take over the work that he has been doing. So he's pointed to the broader community and to the fact that this broader community can support him. They can enhance his ministry. They can enhance his own ability to persevere. Elijah's encouraged in this sitting to encounter God afresh. We read that he was resting in a cave there on Mount Horrible, Mount Sinai, but both mean the same mountain. And in the midst of that time of rest, God begins to challenge him regarding what is he doing there? That question is posed to him twice. What are you doing here? And after the first time God poses it to him, he says to Elijah, go and stand on the mountain as the Lord passes by. Now, it appears when we look closely at the text that Elijah doesn't actually do this because the next thing we hear, he's still in the cave. And in fact, after those amazing signs of wind and hail and uh, wind and earthquake and fire, he eventually moves to the mouth of the cave. So it sounds like he was quite deeply there in the cave, hiding away from what was going on. Or inspiring signs like earthquakes and fire and rain were seen by the people of this time, the people of the ancient Near East, as characteristic of the activity of God. And indeed, the God of Israel had responded in similar ways at certain times. But here we're focused on the fact that God can work in vastly different ways, in much quieter, unexpected ways. Elijah is seeing that God doesn't just act with power and drama. There comes a point, a turning point in the story, and we, if we remember the old version of this story, it talks about a still small voice. Some of the newer versions call it a gentle whisper or the sound of sheer silence. It's in the quietness that Elijah really encounters God again in the quietness that confronts him, in the quietness as he comes to the mouth of the cave where he's just venturing a little closer to God who he seems to be moving away from prior to that. And as he ventures to the mouth of the cave, it says he covered his face with his cloak as a sign of reverence and humility and awe. Yet again, the Lord asks the same question. What are you doing there, Elijah? And again, Elijah responds in exactly the same words. The previous time he begins to detail all the things he's been doing for God, all the wonderful ways he's been serving God and how he's all on his own and it's just too much. And so he does this again, even after all this experience. He still does the same thing. But God continues to interact with him and God continues to commission him 
to go and do something now, to move out of the cave, to go back to where he came from, and in that going back to commission Elisha as another prophet who can follow on in the work that he has been doing. The cloudy lens that's been obscuring Elijah's view of what's really going on in the big picture slowly seems to be clearing and he's got a pathway forward to follow and indeed he seems to follow it. In the ensuing chapters we read a lot about other prophets and what they were doing in Israel at that time which again tends to remind us of those prophets that Obadiah had rescued who are indeed active and are part of this community of which Elijah can be a part. It's a lovely story and a story that can speak to us when we're recognising that we ourselves need times of refreshment and renewal, where our own vigour is dissipated, when our vision perhaps is a bit cloudy. In the life of the Christian church as a whole, we need times of renewal, times in which we are stirred up to re-embrace a fresh sense of God and God's presence amongst us. And we hear stories of that on large, in large-scale movements and smaller movements. And we may indeed have been involved in such things ourselves in our Christian journey. Just as God cared for Elijah in his time of need, so we can be assured that God cares for us and that God is about that business of renewing and refreshing us. God can give us a new vision. God can remind us and recommission us with the task that he has for us to do in his service. We've been reflecting in recent weeks as we encountered Pentecost at the work of the Holy Spirit as one with us to comfort us and encourage us and to make Christ real, one who can renew our vision. There are times when we may, like Elijah, have moved away and be occupying our own variety of a cave moving further from the presence of God, being hesitant to come close to God. And in such times, perhaps we need to hear God asking us also, what are you doing there? And be ready to respond to what God would say. Ready to hear that God often speaks to us in quietness and stillness. Perhaps sometimes we need to hear that we're not indispensable, that there are a whole lot of others in this community of faith who are going to continue the work of God and that we're just a part of that amazing movement together. And we're called to share together, to love one another, to care for one another, to share of ourselves with each other in this community. There may also be unexpected times when in the quietness God seems to speak to us in a way we haven't understood before, capturing our attention and showing us what we need to do next in life. God isn't locked down to one mode of appearing and sometimes when God may seem absent, we may indeed encounter the voice of God to us. Amen. We're going to continue in our worship of God as we continue to reflect on God's willingness to embrace us as we are and to lead us through the journey of life as we sing together, Come As You Are.
We come now to our time of sharing notices and concerns or information with the congregation. Um, Anne, I'm sure, has some things to share with the others that need, wanted to share something. We'll go to you, Anne. I come a little bit red-faced. I embarrassed. Um, I put in the news sheet that the meeting tomorrow for the church council is at 2 p.m. It's at 1.15, so apologies. So please come at 1.15. Um, it's a big, big day because we're doing some planning. We're looking at the visions and where we want to, where we've been, where we want to go, and just trying to start that process. And then we'll come back to the congregation and share what we've got and we invite people in the congregation to start to think about what you will see as our vision and our where you'd like to go and we can get your input for that. There's also uh, the survey that we did. We've got the results of that and we'll be looking at that and that will come back to the congregation too. The other thing is, um, can people from the council just meet for a little while? We've, we're just trying to think about what we're going to do about Robin and um, having nobody in the office. So if the council members can meet after church um, straight away and then we can go and have a cup of coffee. Thank you. Peter's going to lead us in the prayers of the people. Let's join then in prayer as we speak to God. We thank you, gracious God, for speaking to us through all the common scenes of our lives and sowing hope in unlikely places. You are the shaft of light that shines between the clouds on a showery day. You are the kindly darkness that brings us to rest. You are the friend who waits for us when our weary steps falter. You are the warmth that we feel in the company of our friends. You are like the sea where tides go out, yet always come back to refresh. You are the kindly comment when we feel downhearted. You are the strength that keeps us going when life gets tough. You are the optimism that isn't quelled by the cold hand of doubt. You are the hope that rises after winter cold like flowers in spring. You are the new life like green shoots from the ashes of a bushfire. You are peace when we are buffeted by stormy winds. You are the source of our faith which keeps us on the straight path. We thank you, gracious God, for the gift of your son, Jesus, and his message and example. We thank you for being with us in all the daily scenes of life. Help us to recognize you more often and cooperate with your spirit more readily. Please receive our gratitude and praise, which we offer through Christ Jesus, our guide and friend. And now let us pray for others. We pray for the church in all its forms, that we may share the light of the gospel, which tells us that good is not just what we feel at the time, that truth is absolute and not relative, and regard for others transcends our own self-interest. We pray for a growth of faith in our hearts, God, give us a greater recognition of your presence with us and deeper trust in your care for us in the midst of the challenges we face each day. We pray for Christian communities in other lands who face opposition to embracing the gospel. God, strengthen their hearts and minds to keep the faith. We pray for all who are bound for the blindness of, by the blindness of prejudice and, and preconceived opinions. God, open their eyes to the value and dignity of each human person. 
We pray for all whose lives are degraded by drug abuse, for children whose parents are unable to properly care for them. We pray for the teachers in our schools, overburdened by unrealistic expectations from lawmakers, bureaucrats and parents. We pray for doctors, nurses and paramedics who have worked through the pandemic to keep us healthy. We pray for those within our own congregation who themselves or whose family are suffering illness or sadness. And we pray for those who are afraid to turn up the heating. For all these, we pray that you may strengthen them in your good purposes or comfort them in their hour of sadness or weakness. These and all our prayers we offer to you, O God, through Christ Jesus our Lord, the Son whom you gave to us and who taught us to pray in these words, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Uh, just before I go, I should say that it's nice to see Joy back recovered from her illness and talking to us from the pool again. Good to see Joy. Just thought of a couple of things that it might be good to draw your attention to. This week, if you hadn't realised, is Refugee Week, so it may be a good week to consider ways in which we respond to the refugee crisis that we have throughout our world. And of course, we're particularly concerned about the situation in Ukraine and Russia at this point in time. And I believe, I haven't spoken to Claire, but I believe that Claire might be doing something new today. Is that right? <laughs> yeah, if you haven't noticed in Newsbeat, Claire's um, part of a venture to begin a new faith community this afternoon as a, a part of the larger work of this presbytery and of, the, of Cornish College. So a faith community based in experiencing God in the natural world. And so I'm sure she'd be, well, she'll probably have to get away today, but if she has to, on another occasion, you might like to chat some more to her about that. And um, we can support her with our prayers as she goes into that venture too. We're coming now to the time where we're going to acknowledge our offerings. We recognise that our offerings are often brought electronically these days, but there are some that we um, are going to bring out physically to have before us to remind ourselves of the gift of all that we have to God. Would you like to stand as we do this as a sign of our commitment to God? Let us pray. Loving God, we praise you for drawing us to yourself in Jesus. We thank you for accepting us and we bring these gifts as symbols of our love to you. Take and use them and us and all that we have, that communities around us may know you more truly, that your love and grace may be experienced in new ways through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If you'd like to stay standing, we're going to sing together a hymn that reminds us of part of our missional task in going and sharing the good news of God with others. Go forth and tell. <laughs>
So as we go into the world, may we go encouraged by the loving acceptance of God, inspired by the words and deeds of Jesus Christ, and renewed by the encouraging presence of the Holy Spirit. And may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit rest on us all now and always. Amen. <laughs>